what's going on? This is Brandon. This is Dave. This is Joshua. And this is Ted Nicolau, director of Terror Vision and Subspecies, among other films. And you're now tuned in to PVD Horror. Very nice. Very nice. So uh, everybody, thank you for uh, listening to this episode. We are very excited as we are sitting here today with the filmmaker, Ted Nicolau. Uh, Ted's career has spanned over the last four decades, and he's brought us such films <laughs> as Terror Vision, <laughs> Subspecies, uh, Vampire Journals, and many, many more. Ted, I'm sorry to embarrass you if that just did. Um, but thanks for joining the show. <laughs> uh, sure, man. Thanks for having me. Of course. Ted, you have so many cult classics under your belt. What inspired you to become a filmmaker? You know, uh, I set out in life to be a doctor. Uh, and I got uh, kind of sidetracked by rock and roll and um, played in some bands. And uh, when I was in uh, first year at uh, University of Texas in Austin, I uh, befriended a guy named Daniel Pearl who was uh, another hippie like me and uh, went on to become a director of photography of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, and we were good buddies. And um, one night, another friend took me to see uh, a film called Juliet of the Spirits. And uh, when I saw that film, suddenly it occurred to me that I could take everything I loved about writing and about music. And uh, I had a 16 millimeter camera when I was a teenager that belonged to my dad and we used to make movies. Um, and it, it occurred to me I could use everything that I really loved in making movies. And so Daniel and I both kind of had the same realization about the same time and we both kind of dropped out of the courses we were in and signed up for the film department at the University of Texas. That's awesome. How, is that how you got involved with Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Uh, yeah, basically, uh, we were in film school, and uh, I was kind of like uh, studying to be a director and editing, and uh, Daniel was into being a director of photography. And uh, for money, I used to be a boom operator for a guy named Courtney Gooden, who was like the preeminent sound uh, engineer around Austin. And when Texas Chainsaw Massacre started crewing up, they, they got Daniel to be director of photography. Courtney was busy working on another film at the time. So uh, the job kind of came down to me as his boom operator and as a friend of Daniel's. So that's how I got involved with Chainsaw Massacre. That's pretty cool. Any good stories for, that haven't been told yet? <clears throat> About Chainsaw Massacre? Yeah. No, oh, man, I think every story has been told of Chainsaw <laughs> Massacre. I was the sound man. So I was basically trying to stay out of everybody's way and, and just kind of make sure the microphone was placed in a way that, you know, everybody could be heard in their dialogue. Uh, and basically, you know, taking notes of every take, you know, what was good, what was bad about each take. And um, in the end, you know, sometimes I thought Toby was doing things that didn't I didn't agree with. So I would note those down on the on the sound reports as well, never thinking that he would ever see them. Uh, but when it when they were editing, it turned out the they couldn't find the script supervisor's notes. So they uh, went to my sound reports so they could kind of organize the dailies. And he saw those notes and he was really furious with me for a number of years after that, you know. Hey, we all have our own ideas and you know, <laughs> we, well, yeah. <laughs> we were smart alecky film uh, students you know we thought we knew everything at the time mm -hmm. so i noticed your son alex has followed in your footsteps working on horror films have you guys ever worked on a project together and what kind of advice have you given him over the years in his career uh you know what uh, he uh is a really good editor mm -hmm. um i when Charlie asked Charlie Band asked me to direct uh, uh, Zombies versus Strippers, uh, it wasn't the kind of project I really wanted to do. But I recommended Alex as a somebody who had just gotten out of film school at Santa Cruz, uh, UC Santa Cruz, and so Charlie said, "Okay, if you agree to produce the film, then he can direct it." So we worked on that film together. Uh, he didn't take any of my advice, uh, as kids will not do. Uh, but then he's gone on to become a really good editor as well. And he edited 
uh, my film Don't Let Her In. And okay. uh, among other films, he's been editing for Charlie. He cuts trailers and um, yeah, anybody needs a trailer cut, Alex Nicolau is the guy to go to. That's awesome. So I noticed that Alex is also a musician so I'm, and you have a music background also. Um, I started a new playlist which features some of our guests' favorite songs. Um, could you share two songs that made an impact on your life to add to this project? Wow, man. Uh, yeah, you know what? I'm like an old, you know, folky from way back. And uh, I think the two of the songs that just kind of blew my mind, uh, one is uh, Dylan's um, Like a Rolling Stone. That song, when it first came on the radio, was just yeah. like blew everybody's minds. And then uh, The Birds, Mr. Tambourine Man, also another film song that just kind of took you into another world, you know, yeah. back then. Yeah, I see you switched up the hairstyle. You don't have all spiky today. You know what? Pandemic, <laughs> man, couldn't get a haircut for months and months. And so it just started growing. I was like, okay, what the hell? You know, I like it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good, man. Are you going to go back to the spiky head style? I don't think for? so. Maybe, uh, maybe eventually, but I'm going to rock this for a while, you know? There you go. <laughs> go for it. Yeah. I personally love it. I, <laughs> pandemic hair, pandemic beard. Yeah, uh, man. Yeah. I can't grow a beard because my wife would hate it, but, uh, but I, <laughs> I can grow my hair out. Yeah. That's why I grew a beard. My wife hates it. <laughs> uh, so Ted, um, you know, we're, we're big fans of the subspecies films and I'm going to admit I'm probably the, um, I'm late to the game on these films. Cause wow, I actually huh? just, I just watched them within the past two years because these guys recommended them. Wow. Um, cool. So, uh, the one thing, like just watching these films, you know, and more recently, I'm like really struck by like the setting, you know, it's, it's very beautiful, Gothic, um, I think it plays such a huge role in the film in the at, like for the viewer in like kind of like transporting you into this like Romania that you're, you know, you're supposed to be in. Um, could you describe like that process of finding the perfect setting and how it <clears throat> has influenced the films? Yeah, for me, uh, when Charlie Band asked me to do uh, this movie subspecies, uh, I was not a big uh, vampire movie fan. I was more of a Frankenstein fan as a kid. Uh, but the part of the deal was he had a, a producer who wanted to uh, shoot in Romania, who and in Romania, the, the Romanian film industry would pay for all the cost in Romania and all Charlie had to do is pay for the American cast and post-production and hotels and that kind of stuff. And uh, so he sent me over to Romania for a week way before we started shooting to see if, uh, if I thought we could shoot there. And Romania in 1990 was just, you know, six months out past the revolution. And the, the whole city was just desolation and gray and no advertising anywhere, and no products in the store shelves. Um, and it was, it had such a foreboding kind of atmosphere in the happy city, you know, even in the nightclubs and everything, it was very scary. Um, but I met uh, Vlad Paunescu, who was went on to be the director of photography of the films and later on the producers of the of the sequels, and his uh, girlfriend then and now his wife Juana, who was a costume designer, and they kind of took me under their wing and we traveled uh, from Bucharest up into Transylvania and saw castles and monasteries and all of the possible places that that we could film. And for a filmmaker who likes to shoot on location, uh, once I saw those the places that we would have access to, you know, it was like, yes, I'm, I'll do it no matter what. You know, it seems yeah. scary and really a difficult process to go through it because the the they didn't have that much equipment and the crews were not used to working kind of Western style. And uh, so, but the but the places that I could shoot and the 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 mood that that would bring to the movie just kind of made it impossible to say no to yeah can this might be a stupid question but what did that cat the castle that you guys use what what is that like in a normal day like when you're not shooting there well how do they, what do they use it for is it vacant are they doing stuff well here's the deal the um 
in subspecies number one, the castle interiors, for the most part, were on a soundstage uh, at the uh, old Romanian National Film Studios in Bufta. And they had a throne room and a, another little kind of dungeony chamber and, a, and one more chamber. And uh, that, was, that was primarily the interiors that we used. Then there is a castle up in uh, uh, near Poyana Brashoff, a ski resort up in Transylvania um, called Rizhnov that was like a fortified village on uh, on top of a mountain and that's where a lot of the exteriors were shot and some of the uh, underground passageways um, and that was a uh, just a a ruin with the kind of one watch one guy watching over it now it's a unesco uh unesco uh, uh historical site and a, kind of a tourist attraction in romania but it's that was my hope that it place. would be my hope was that it would be a ruin that you could go visit because I, I love stuff like that <laughs> that would yeah be awesome. when we first went it was like the the saying was uh we've got to find the man with the key because any place that you wanted to visit as a location was always locked up and there was like yeah. one drunk man with a key yeah. that you had to track down and there the man with the key would kind of let us in and yeah. um we could wander around in these places that was that were just like untouched by people for you know, hundreds of years. And, and that, that place in particular, the forest uh, where the girls are uh, running around uh, is just this old growth forest that was also kind of on the road leading up the hill to the, to the fortress. Amazing. So yeah, that was like, yeah. oh, and then the, uh, the other place was the uh, kind of fortified monastery, that big circular place where the girls are staying. Uh, and, and that was a, a, another place that was just like nothing at the time, you know, was like in the middle of the town with uh, maybe a tourist every once in a while would come visit it. But, you know, those places were just at, the, at that time, you know, you just had to kind of pay somebody under the table and go shoot there. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so the other, so setting is definitely a huge um, part of the films. The other part is character development, um, which you spend a lot of focus on throughout the, all the films. Like we, we see, there's a few like characters that we kind of see throughout each of the films and, you know, it's, but the one particular one is Radu, obviously, like he's the, it feels like he's important to you almost um, when you're watching the films, it almost feels like I don't know if he's like a part of you or that you've written or <laughs> it, really? it just feels like you have some ownership over this character and he just feels like kind of personal um and I was just kind of curious like if you could describe like your relationship to that character and how you created him you know I think as I look at my films uh in a way I identify with the monster as much as I identify with the with the human victims um, and I think that the same goes for subspecies. I did not write the script for the first uh, subspecies. So I can't really claim much credit except beyond uh, kind of rewriting on the go as we were shooting. Uh, my, the, the kind of way I envisioned him, I can take credit for. And that's kind of the, not your Count Dracula, but more like your Count Orloff or something from, uh, from, um, from Max Schreck, you know, I, I believe that vamp, that kind of vampire is closer to what I think a monstrous vampire should be. Um, and I was really, really fortunate that Anas Hove uh, was cast in that part. And, and again, I can't even take credit for that because uh, we were in casting in Los Angeles and we had kind of narrowed it down to one particular actor for Radu. And then I took off to go start pre-production in Bucharest. And while I was there, uh, Michael Watson, who plays uh, Stefan in the first subspecies, uh, said, I've got a colleague that works on General Hospital with me who would make a great Radu. And he brought Anas Hove into the casting people. And, um, and that was the luckiest thing that happened to this entire series, yeah. you know, was because Anas brought, uh, you know, the first, the first film, we were just trying to find out how does he sound when he speaks and how does he move about and, and 
you know, kind of focusing more on the kind of dominant cruelty of the character. But once I took over writing the scripts for two and three and eventually four, uh, we were able to kind of take what, what I understood was really good about Anas as an actor and kind of fold that into the character as well. And um, so I, I don't know if Radu is like the, the kind of stand in for the cruel side of myself. I don't see myself quite as so dominant or, or uh, uh, you know, horrifying, but I do see Anas as a guy who, who has, he is a scary character, even uh, as a person, he can, he's like got a volcanic temper and, and his big emotions. And he's, he's a great kind hearted person and a dear friend now, but, it, but, you know, he made me cry once or twice on the first subspecies, just mm -hmm. by being kind of like, he was hard to handle sometimes, you know, and the first subspecies was, uh, you know, took longer to shoot than, than anybody anticipated. The actors were disgruntled that they were having to be there. It was freezing ass cold all the time. Um, and the wine was like a dollar a bottle. And so drunken evenings in this empty hotel were like legendary, you know, glasses being swept off the table and people cursing me. And to call home, you had to wait two hours or three hours for a phone call to go through. Uh, you couldn't get a lot of stuff that you wanted. Sometimes you couldn't get bottled water to have on the set. Uh, so, so the it was a difficult shoot with you know me trying to just manage people's anxiety about being there. Michael Watson was kind of a real handful uh, to deal with too. So, so the first film was like uh, so difficult that I kind of started keeping a journal every day uh, just to transmuted into comedy for myself you know we'd have dinner the glasses would get swept off the table the colleagues would keep on drinking and I'd go up to my room and just write here's what happened today holy shit and just uh kind of like make it funny for myself you know and now I read back on that and it, it, it's like that the experience was like a novel with various people kind of coming into our orbit getting spun around a little bit going out misadventures people getting kicked out of hotels, honest being arrested, uh, just like crazy, crazy occurrences every day. Um, but but the, 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 at the center of it all was Honest Hove as Radu. And he really, once we agreed uh, on subspecies two that uh, no drinking on the set, no drinking during the day. And when you go in to have the makeup taken off at night, I'll come in and we'll have a bottle of wine together. And we sort of lived by that code uh, for the next films and everything was was great. I, so, I, Joshua, I'm sorry. I just wanted to ask one question about the character. <laughs> Is there ever an explanation why his fingers are so long? Uh, no, no, that's like, uh, okay. <laughs> no, uh, I think that gets back to uh, Nosferatu, you know, uh, even though Nosferatu, I think it's more like fingernails or so yeah. long. Uh, yeah. But I just wanted that kind of spidery kind of fingers. It just seemed very creepy to me, you know. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. The uh, So all the problems from the first subspecies, they're like legendary in the community. <laughs> Everyone who knows about those species knows about all these problems, right? So the big question is, when are you going to turn that diary into a movie so we can see exactly what happened behind the scenes? <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty funny. I'd like to do that. If anybody would pay for it, maybe a crowdfunding <laughs> would pay for it. Uh, it was... Yeah, I mean, uh, my journal is available for people that want to buy it, you know, and it's it is... It's like a, if you're a fan of the films, when, when you see kind of what, what went on to kind of get the film made and the, the many battles, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty astonishing that the film was ever finished, much less kind of received well enough to, um, to carry on and make, you know, more sequels to it. Yeah, you got to send us that link because uh, I want to read it. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'll send it to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... You touched on this in, in the beginning. You you had a 
speaking of writing, you wrote notes for Toby Hooper and he got mad at you. How did you bury that? Uh, it took years. I mean, he, you know, I didn't really, uh, he didn't see them until after the film had finished shooting. So I was sort of out of his life for a number of years, you know, and then uh, in Los Angeles when he was living out here, you know, we would see each other occasionally at screenings. We were never really close friends or anything, you know. And he just kind of like did the nose up, like I read your nose. <laughs> he was like, uh, when he first did, read it, he was like, what did that, what the hell did he think I'd never see this? And honestly, <laughs> you know, I've never, I've directed a lot of movies and never really looked at the, at the uh, sound reports, you know, um, but so I didn't expect that he would ever read it, you know, okay. um, and I, eventually I guess he just kind of forgave me or, you know, Toby probably forgot about it completely, you know. A little bit of a coincidence. Today is actually Toby Hooper's birthday. So it's oh, ironic. Oh, wow, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. If if I remember correctly, he did eggshells before that, and that was it. So, you know what? Constructive criticism. You know, that's, you know, uh, I mean, we were little snotty film school students who thought we knew everything. And, and uh, we had been kind of taught that every moment counts on a shooting day and you've got to come really well prepared and what we saw on the set of chainsaw on chainsaw massacre was basically uh people were not prepared and we'd spend the first couple of hours of every day just trying to figure out what we were going to shoot you know and that just kind of drove us crazy especially because we're sitting out in like 100 degree texas summer you know yeah yeah the uh so i'm, I'm going to change it up on you to one of your more recent films, which was Don't Let Her In. Yeah. Um, I loved it. And I was I talked to Dave, he watched it too. And I was like, no way, you watched it? Uh, there was a lot of metaphysical stuff there that was pretty spot on. The story was great. The setting was great. The acting was great. Like, it was a really good film. Oh, and, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> um, but I, I wanted to know, what was it like coming up with that film and how was it shooting it? Uh, you know, uh, Charlie, again, Charlie Band came to me and, and said, I'm doing these movies. They're going to be 30 minute episodes, you know, two episodes, uh, going to release them one week later. And, and it seemed like a kooky idea to me because you sort of, OK, I, I believe in the pandemic, we've all started watching kind of long form series. And, and I love the the kind of novelistic uh, depth that you can achieve like in long form series like that. But two episodes, I mean, it's just like a kind of a puff in the wind really. Uh, so I would have rather have made that as one feature, but okay, uh, at this point, pandemic had been going on for like over a year. I was ready to do something, get out of my house and do anything possible. So he proposed this and, and the budgets on these little things was, were very, very low. Uh, the schedules were like, uh, five days, although I think I begged and got six days. Um, so uh, he said, you know, propose me some ideas. And I proposed him three or four ideas. And this was the one he liked. And it was sort of the, the idea was the germ of it was like a roommate from hell. Uh, and that is really from hell. And um, I wanted to do something I knew that for me, I like, I, I have ambitions to make shots that count you know and things that look interesting and uh to, to get good performances from actors and and that takes time so so since there wasn't that much time i want i, I decided to kind of pull in the story and see if i could if i could tell a story with like three characters and one location and um so that was kind of the the germ of the idea um and you know my son being a musician, I sort of kind of like attached that quality to this yeah. character. Uh, the uh, the character played by Lauren Doctor, uh, Serena, the kind of uh, demon possessed person, um, to me was like an interesting character. You know, it, it's a little bit Rosemary's Baby for the for the two thousands. And I wish it was an hour and a half long because I think it would have had a lot more depth kind of in the second act, but it is what it is. Um, and uh, I, 
thought, well, okay, a, a good location that, that sort of has some of the qualities that I like, which is uh, the location expresses a certain kind of atmosphere that, that the movie wants to express. Um, in my mind, I remembered the downtown Los Angeles kind of arts district from, but what I'm remembering is like the arts district from back in the punk days when it was scary as hell and Al's bar was happening and, and the, 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 there were warehouses everywhere, old warehouses. So I thought, okay, it's gonna be in a warehouse uh, loft. And so then I started looking, Googling around and trying to find images to kind of inspire me and, and to express what I wanted the film to be. And I found this one warehouse picture of it. And I was like, wow, that place is amazing. Uh, but I didn't know where it was or if we could get it as a location. Then I started driving around downtown, the old arts district, which is now the most like uh, dressed up, uh, modern uh, teardowns of the old buildings and modern uh, uh, apartment buildings and barely anything of the old world left there. And I was driving down the street and, and there it was, the, the building that I got the image of. And I was like, okay, this is the place. Um, it was too expensive. And then we spent like another two weeks kind of exploring every possibility in warehouses around uh, downtown LA um, and finally came back and Charlie said, okay, let me call and see if I can make a deal. And, and he made a deal with the owner. And this warehouse is like the guys owned it since the eighties and doesn't, you know, all around it are new construction and things being torn down. Uh, and this guy just is keeping this place as a film location. And it's, you, you'll see it everywhere once you kind of are aware of it. Um, and so, so we had the location, I had three actors and then just kind of came up with a story. And I like the idea of, of gemstone bowls that have some magical properties and, and you know, all that stuff. I just kind of do a little bit of research and then use my imagination to kind of uh, expand upon it and kind of threw in a little bit of uh, teasing of full moon with, uh, with Amber being a, a poster artist for a crappy uh, horror film company. Um, yeah. So yeah, just it, it sort of evolved from the basic desire to make something really simple that I could kind of make sure I could do it well in the time. And, and you know, it's got its flaws, but I think it, it, it has a nice pace to it, you know? Yeah. I Was like it your idea to have Corona zombies poster in it oh yeah <laughs> yeah i said charlie i need a really shitty uh, <laughs> <I didn't> even... <laughs> piece of art for some really <laughs> doofusy <laughs> horror film and he went let me think about it and <laughs> that's what he gave me yeah <laughs> so as as i saw it i was like oh it's corona zombies <laughs> I'll never get it you know uh -huh. uh, yeah it's a very self-referential sort of a film yeah mm -hmm. I, actually even in like uh the scene where you you're introduced to the to the apartment they go up in the elevator and she goes we could take the stairs but i like the way this feels better and it's kind of like acknowledging like what you were talking about with that look you were going for with the apartment. yeah that was for me the whole the whole uh search for the location was centered around needing a an old school freight elevator for that last a climactic scene where the freight elevator is slowly coming up and you can hear the machinery and you know that Serena is coming that was sort of like in my mind that was was necessary for the film and so we were really lucky that we found all of those things in yeah. this one location yeah um so her the actors the room, not asked. sorry Dave. Gonna... uh her leaving the room uh, when she was going backwards that was really badass. Oh, uh -huh, uh huh. Yeah, that was. Uh, I was like, uh, Lauren, uh, we need her to move in some really freaky way. Can you th come up with something? And so the next morning, she came in and went, "Well, what about this?" You know, and and it was. I went, "Wow, that's pretty damn good." Okay, we got it. You know, because there are certain things you go, "Wow," and in my mind, it, there's this freaky scrabbling kind of walk, and and you know, we don't have the time or the or the budget to find people with really weird, you know, bodies or anything like that. We have to kind of make do with what we have to, to work with. And um, so you, you kind of 
put a lot of it on the actors, you know, even her, the chanting that she did, you know, it was like, Lauren, come up with something here, would you? And, and, you know, Lauren Doctor was like, uh, like my first choice for this part, it, because she has like such a kind of mysterious look about her. She's super beautiful and interesting. I was trying to tell them, I was telling them before you got on, oh, yeah, that was a great casting call with her. I, I, she's, she was awesome. I, and she is very, awesome. And she, too. she was able to, to, em she embraced the, the role, you know, yeah. from the, from the kind of weirdly seductive parts to the more com completely bonkers parts, you know, and um, same thing, uh, same thing with Amber too. She, you know, had to go from being this, you know, sparkly girl to being a demon by the end, you know, nope, no spoilers, sorry. Uh, and and uh, she did it too, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, you have this film with you know these these young actors, and while I was watching it, and I I feel bad now because I'm kind of referencing how your your time in the in the business twice now. Don't <laughs> but, worry uh, about it, man. I'm I, I, I accept <laughs> it. You know. <laughs> I was kind of curious what it's like, you know, uh, making a film with young actors now as opposed to how it was, like let's say mid '80s, because you also had young actors in like Terrorvision and stuff like that. You know, uh, the funny thing about being older is you don't you look older and you look decrepit and all of that, but you don't feel older in your soul you know yeah. uh and so when you when i get together with the young actors i mean to me i love actors and and young or old whatever they are are a certain kind of person and they're you kind of reach into them in a way and and really collaborate with them on something that you both care about so so the 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 idea of kind of becoming close to them is the only thing that really matters. And, you know, uh, the, the weirdest things for me, you know, in terms of difference between director and actors were some of those urban movies that I did uh, with Mel Johnson Jr., uh, like uh, Incredible Dr. Bones, which was not very good, but uh, uh, the, um, the little demon baby, uh, the demon doll one. With, Ragdoll, yes, with a with a entirely cast of of black actors. Uh, there, I was like Mr. White Man, you know, just among <laughs> this these people that were so alive and cool, you know. Um, so for me, that was a, the time that I was like, wow, I am a different kind of a man than these people. But 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 all that matters once you get together is like you're you're kind of like collaborating on creating these moments that feel real, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, getting to work like on the movie Dragon World with uh, Andrew Keir, who was like near the end of his life, the same sort of thing, you know? It's like you just, age doesn't really count when you're talking about characters and, and creating a story, you know? Yeah. So it's funny. Um... We were talking right before the show, um, the show, talking about like your love for vampires and then finding out like you're a big Frankenstein fan. And I'm like, well, this guy makes so many great vampire films. So you said that, you know, you, you were big into Frankenstein. What got you back into doing another vampire film for vampire journals? Uh, you know, after I did the first uh, subspecies, mm -hmm. the um, the qualities of a vampire that that are uh, that make him kind of the monster and also the kind of uh, immortal being that he is, make him so much more interesting than Frankenstein, who is just kind of like his lump of decayed brain, you know, uh, that I, I, I came to understand what's cool about vampires. Um, and, and then there was, there's the, the kind of Nosferatu vampire, the kind of really truly undead dead thing and then charlie uh said let's do a vampire movie i want to do a vampire movie about uh uh vampires that live with a in a casino because charlie's a big gambler um and so the idea of doing a set of vampires that are much more cultured and uh 
human looking kind of appealed to me too you know i mean I, i'm not a big twilight fan or any of that but the but the idea of these beings that live kind of in a under a, a subterranean city beneath the city really appealed to me and that that whole idea of the city beneath the city something that re resonates in my brain you know in my imagination um so yeah and the idea of of a the knowledge be the kind of wealth the mastery over people the 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 kind of uh like loneliness i mean uh, vampires have so much uh emotional kind of resonance that that um, i grew to love vampires and and now frankenstein is my second choice you know <laughs> so we're gonna stay with the vampire vein here <clears throat> And okay. uh, it's going to go straight to uh, my favorite film of all time, Puppet Master versus Demonic Toys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So we, we talked about it a little bit before we, we started the podcast and stuff. And I've heard you talk about it numerous times. Um, and that was a promised film for sci-fi, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so do you feel any different about it now as opposed to when you did it? You know, uh, that was one of the, uh, a real problematic film for me. Uh, I, it had been a while since I'd had a chance to direct anything. Uh, I was desperate to, to work. Um, and Charlie recommended me to this producer, Jeff Franklin, who had bought the rights to do a one-off movie, uh, Puppet Master for Sci-Fi Channel, because Charlie had promised it to Sci-Fi Channel and never delivered it. So uh, I met with Jeff Franklin and I was like, okay, here's the script. I don't like the script very much. Can I rewrite it? And so they let me rewrite it. I kind of went a little too far off the canon of Puppet Master, I guess, and made it a little bit too funny. Um, then Jeff Franklin, you know, thought he'd made a major casting coup with Corey Feldman, which was like a major horrible casting choice. Um, he uh, cast um, uh, Sylvia Suvadova as a, um, supposed to be an American cop, uh, but she's from um, Czechoslovakia and is an amazing actress and, and is really a wonderful human being to work with, um, but uh, was, was miscast in the movie. And I, once she was cast, I should have revised that character and made her a spy or something you know but but by that time we were too far into pre-production uh we shot it in um sofia bulgaria uh where jeff franklin had done two or three movies previous and this was the last in the batch of movies he was doing and so i think the budget was kind of used up by that time so i had to fight for every little bit that i wanted uh sofia was not I was used to shooting in Romania where there were, where there was like kind of wrecked beauty everywhere you looked. And Sophia did not quite have that. It had a lot of uh, wreckage and a lot of kind of communist block structures, but, uh, but it didn't quite have the, the historic charm of Bucharest. Uh, and the director of photography uh, didn't like me one little bit because he thought I was too much of a smart aleck or something because I had worked with Adolfo Bartoli, the Italian cinematographer of vampire journals, who's like a brilliant person at lighting. And David Worth, the director of photography of Puppet Master versus Demonic Toys, didn't like when I wanted him to make light more beautiful and stuff like that. So, so I was fighting all the time with these guys. And... Um, and I don't like puppet movies very much. Um, I don't like working with puppets. I'd much rather work with people. So, so it was like a, I did the job and I, I took it and I did the best I could with the locations that I had. Uh, uh, and, and the movie is what it is. It sort of is like, a, it's got some qualities that are kind of good. And then a lot of stuff that I, I think fans don't like very much. You know, I don't know, you saw it. What did you think? Uh, the, can well, be honest. <laughs> I, I got the DVD and I was super excited because I, I hadn't seen it on television and I was like, oh, I can't wait. And I called my brother. I'm like, you're coming over. And we watched it and we were like, this is interesting. 
yeah, like, yeah, yeah. The yeah. big thing, like, is anybody trying in this film? Um, that was the big thing. It felt like a lot of people, like everyone in the film just kind of was there and they weren't putting any effort into it, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I mean, that's what it seemed like. Uh, but it was still one of those movies where you're like, wow, we got to watch this again. And we, me and my brother watched it like three times in a row. Oh and, man, that was a big yeah, commitment. It was one of those, and we were just, you know, it was just one of those films where like, are they for real? Like it wasn't Puppet Master, it wasn't Demonic Toys, but it was this weird hybrid and we went with it. And it wasn't, I didn't think it was as terrible as everyone thinks it was. Like we laughed a lot during the movie. Like it was well, really, good. Um, I could have done without Corey Feldman. <laughs> yeah, like, I could have done without him too. He was a pain in the butt to work with and, uh, and uh and he didn't like sylvia and sylvia is like such a lovely person and and a really good actress in the right role you know so it was the, the whole movie was just a struggle was a real struggle you and Corey feldman you're not best friends anymore no not really i mean you know we got along okay but but um he did a lot of things that i kept saying don't do that you know and and he, he was Corey feldman what can you do you know yeah uh, is there a diary for that movie no, I should keep diaries on every movie, okay. but you know, it was just subspecies one was just like too too rich to not keep it, you know, and other ones you just sort of get swept away by the work. So as a rock and roller, have you heard Corey Feldman's albums? No, no, I've refused. <laughs> I, I just I can't do it. Look it up. That's all I'm gonna say about that. <laughs> I was gonna say Josh is talking a big game, but he's one of Corey Feldman's biggest fans. So oh yeah. no. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I play that song all everyone in my house hates it. It is the worst song ever. <laughs> That's funny, it gets man. a little catchy. So wow, yeah. Yeah, and I wouldn't let this film like kind of break you down, like you know, saying like it's one of your worst films or anything like that. You know, it's kind of hard taking two franchises and clashing them together. I don't think, I don't think anyone could like give the fans what they wanted. You know, to, when they if to create this type of film, because if you really look at it, like Demonic Toys Two, it's not as good as the first one. And you look at all the Puppet Master uh, films. It, it's hard to compare and stay on topic like with the first one so it's like now you're taking two franchises and putting it together you know i, I just you have all the classics under your belt man don't yeah. even worry about it you know yeah i mean I'm, i kind of don't think about it anymore yeah. you know it, was, it hurt when it when it we first did it because you know you you finish a movie and you go wow this is great yeah. and then you show it to people and then you start to sweat you know uh so so no matter what it, you put as much effort into a crappy movie as you put into a movie that turns out great uh it's just the chemistry of the film just is lacking in something you know uh and and in that film it was it was like people i mean Corey did it for the money and sylvia did it because she wanted to work and uh you know it just it it it, it is what it is you know and and yeah, I'm not a big fan of the Puppet Master movies, even. So I, I, I should have, I should have said no. Sometimes you should say no, you know, and you don't because you just want the experience. Yeah, I'm sure it's attractive. You see these two, like franchise films, and they're kind of presenting them like, you know, do do you want to do this? It probably would be tough to say no for anyone, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, and what happens is sometimes. Uh, I get so hung up kind of trying to make the scenes look as cool as possible that by the time you get to the climax of the movie near the end of the shoot, you don't have enough time shooting days left to really give the climax its proper due, you know, so that's a hard lesson that I've learned over time, you know, that you really have to carve out enough time that the climax doesn't get shortchanged. Sure. Thing I, I know that like if we were to give somebody else the pitch the idea saying hey do a new terror vision here do a new subspecies you know they'll be in the same position where it will never kind of like lead up to what you did you know <clears throat> so yeah to do a new terror vision would be a a real trick you know yeah. i mean I've, I've thought about it me and diane franklin were talking uh not that long ago about doing a a sequel to it you know that mm -hmm. and i could see doing it 
I don't know. Uh, I think there are enough fans of television around, you know, of guys of your generation, you know, that, yeah. that kind of were teenagers when it first came out or when it first came out on video, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, I play with that idea every once in a while. Like if you did it, I think it would be great just because it's just like everything you did with the first one. So yeah. yeah, the first one was like a very lucky combination of screenplay and casting, you know, and production design. I mean, everything kind of worked to, I mean, the, the movie is flawed and, and all of that. And I, I get that it's not a perfect movie or anything and it's not great cinema, but it is a perfect combination of creature actors, production design, cinematography, and, uh, and music, you know, that, that really kind of yielded this movie that, that, uh, and I have to give it up to, to Garrett Graham and Mary Warnoff and Diane Franklin and John Grise and all the cast that really kind of took what was on the page and just m brought it to greater, more hyperbolic kind of life, you know? Yeah. We actually had Diane Franklin on the show last year and we were able to oh, yeah. this, this film, you know, and it's like one of our favorite films. And we had a lot of questions that we wanted to ask her about the film that happened behind the scenes. There was a lot of stuff that happened, I think, because she just filmed it and just she didn't know like the backstory. Like I had one question. I was like, why was this film taken out of theaters just after four days after the release? Oh, man. You know what? Uh, I think what happened was Charlie uh, Empire Pictures, uh, he had three movies that he wanted to release in theaters. He had a distribution team of guys that were okay, um, but he didn't have the money to you know, put the trailers in the theaters well in advance. He didn't have the money to buy the advertising that he needed. Um, he spent a lot of money releasing Troll and uh, I think Eliminators were the two movies that came before Terrorvision. The week of Terrorvision, the space shuttle Challenger blew up and was a national tragedy and everybody was really sad. And uh, so when Terrorvision came out in the theaters, you know, it was like, I went to one cinema and there were maybe, you know, 12 people in the theater. Uh, just, uh, there was not enough uh, marketing done for the film. And uh, then the reviews were, murderous you know the reviews just like just slashed the film and slashed me and just you know it was not a film that was meant for you know critics it was a film that was meant for kind of like stoner you know young people you know yeah. um and uh so i think it you know the theaters were like get this fucking film out of, out of our theater you know yeah. <laughs> we're not making any money uh and it took took years i think really you know of television being on videotape and kids mm -hmm. showing it to their friends and slumber parties and turning their little brothers onto it and little sisters onto it and it wasn't until like maybe 15 or 20 years later that i started hearing from people that were actually fans of the film you know it was really satisfying to me too to see that the film that kind of brought me a lot of heartache when it first came out due to the reaction to it uh, was actually still around and still around today and still kind of garnering fans too. Um, when we were talking to Diane, she had kind of expressed that she felt like the film was almost ahead of its time. Like if it had been made later, it probably would have been received differently. Um, and I think you kind of just answered this. Like, how do you feel if you had, do you feel like this would have been received better if you made it today? Uh, maybe, you know, I think television didn't look like any film that you had ever seen before in a way, you know, maybe Tim Burton films kind of come close to it. Uh, and, and maybe Eating Raul had certain qualities because it had Mary Warnoff. But I think the movie itself was just too odd for like mainstream you know yeah. and, and would it would it be successful today i don't know man i'm in the days of comic book movies and marvel and all of that i think television is just is is just like the odd little cousin movie you know yeah, yeah. We love so it yeah it's it's a great film so i just want to know where was your what was your mindset when you were writing that film you know because <laughs> it's just like so much going on in that uh, film 
uh, you know, when I was writing that film, I, you know, Charlie, as he does, like shows you a poster and, and yeah. says, here's what the movie's going to be. And, and the poster was like this monster coming out of a TV set. Um, didn't look like the the monster, the hungry beast from Terrorvision. Um, and it, I said, well, can this be a comedy? And I was lucky that he said yes because I don't I didn't see how it could be anything but a comedy with that with that um, and then I started started thinking okay what the kind of writing process was this what characters can can inhabit this world that if they get eaten by the monster you're not going to be too sad about it you know uh, so that it can maintain its comedy and uh so I, I sort of hit me the idea of these swinger parents and the the teenagers, the kids of the of the family that are uh, don't like their parents one little bit, and then the grandfather who was the survivalist. I sort of took all the things that were kind of going on in the '80s around Los Angeles, like you know, uh, swinging parties and porn shoots in the valley. Uh, survivalists were kind of big at that time. And so I kind of went to a lot of survivalist uh, army surplusy kind of stores and read a lot of pamphlets and saw a pamphlet that was like uh, uh, cattails, uh, self-regenerating food source. And there were cattails like the plant cattails, but I was like, wow, lizard tails also self-regenerate. And so kind of came up with the idea of the lizard tail jerky uh, that grandpa makes so the grandfather was sort of based on a, a guy who used to kind of wander around downtown LA in a general outfit with a bunch of plastic planes and stuff on his uh, on his jacket so it's kind of like a an amalgam of of kind of the culture of of 1980s Los Angeles and uh, at the time I was going to this nightclub called Club Lingerie that uh, brought in a lot of great music and the Fibonacci's used to play there a lot and I'd see Mary Warren off there. So it's sort of everything kind of revolved around kind of that little Hollywood world that, that we were that we were working in at the time. Uh, and the script kind of was the script that we shot, but once you get Garrett Graham saying those those lines and Mary Warnoff reacting to it and uh, Diane Franklin rolling her eyes at her doofusy parents, I mean, everything just kind of came to life in a way that was spectacular to me. And when I walked on the sets for the first time and saw, you know, Giovanni Natalucci, this uh, Italian production designer that uh, that was uh, worked with us, um, came to Los Angeles and we looked through a million booklets of location photographs of houses and talked about swingers and what this house could look like and all of that. And he went back to Rome and started designing stuff that when I walked on the sets and saw kind of the sunken living room and the colors and the, the erotic art on the walls and the little bar that he made and the, and the, uh, the, the jacuzzi, the swimming pool size jacuzzi. It was just like, wow, this man just took the imagination of the movie and exploded it into real space. Uh, so, so like I said before, that movie was a lucky combination of cast and production design and cinematography and everybody sort of got the joke and the tone of the film and kind of ran with it, you know, and everybody was having a great time living in Rome. And we had a hotel on the beach in a little town called Tor Vionica, about 20 minutes from the studio with a terrace overlooking the ocean. And so a bunch of us were staying there and having dinners till midnight every night. And some others were staying in the center of Rome. So it was like a, you know, it was like a vacation and getting to make a movie all in one stroke, you know. Um, Ted, I wanted to ask you about uh, one more film. So I got to watch, I watched Ragdoll, which we mentioned a little uh -huh. bit. <laughs> um, so that was interesting because my first uh, question I had while I was watching it was, I wonder what made him make an urban horror film? Because um, it wasn't like you had a bunch of other urban horror films. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
so the other, but I want to ask you that. And I also want to ask you, I, I read that um, this was actually pitched years prior, um, but was held, held off. Is that correct for a number of years? Uh, you know, here's my memory of that. Uh, Empire Pictures was, uh, no, Empire Pictures was gone. This was now full moon. And uh, Charlie had this ongoing thing with making so many movies every year. Um, he had worked with Mel Johnson Jr., the actor who was in um, uh, a Total Recall playing the taxi driver. Um, and Mel uh, had acted in one of Charlie's films. And I think it was Mel who said, let's, you should do a, uh, some urban horror movies and, and uh, you know, give a bunch of black actors a chance to work. Uh, and so he had this script called Ragdoll and maybe it was, you know what? I think Ragdoll was probably one of the posters that Charlie, you know, had commissioned years before and maybe never had a, never had a script that actually worked for it. Um, but Mel uh, kind of, became like the the head of the of the urban uh, pictures and and basically Charlie had a music uh, supervisor who wanted to to find some uh, hip hop sort of acts uh, and and bring them in and, and then release records so it was like this this thing uh, and I think what how I got involved because I'm like so white and so, not soul guy, you know, and it's so weird, uh, was I was the guy that Charlie would send into weird new situations, like when Romania, you know, like, uh, like when we shot Dragon World in, in England. Um, and, and he trusted me as a director. And uh, Mel and I got along really well. Um, so, so yeah, so so you know, it was like, hey, you want to do this film? And once we started casting, and the the quality of actors of, of young people that were just dying to work, who had so much skill and talent, um, it was like, and then with Mel kind of at my side, you know, and, and it was like, okay, we're gonna have a really good time with this, you know, and, and um, James Black who came in and, to play like uh, one of the bad boy brothers of the of the crime syndicate uh i said you know there there was one line of dialogue in that script that that made me think what if this character was like gay and was like a combination of little richard but little richard that would like cut your throat if he if he, if you pissed him off and i said to james you know what if what if he's kind of little richard you know and and uh and James Black just went, yeah, man. And so just through the auditioning process, you know, we kind of refined some of those, those things. And we were so lucky that James did the film, you know? And uh, so, yeah, that uh, it was, it was, I was an odd choice, I admit, uh, but you know, it's a movie and movies are about people and, and all of that. And um, so we did that film and then, you know, then we went on to do, uh, Dr. Bones. And, and by that time, the budgets were slashed to nothing. And the shooting schedule was was very short. So it, it was a more difficult film. But the first one, uh, Mac Alberg, the great cinematographer who did a lot of the early Charlie Van movies, uh, shot with me and, and he, he lit those actors so beautifully, you know, he, he had a, some magic touch to the light. And, um, you know, it, it, it really worked out okay, I think, that film. Yeah. There, was, there was a lot of things that were enjoyable and that were positive about that film. I, I wasn't sure what to expect when I watched it and I found myself like actually fully like uh, enjoying it. And that, that you were totally nailed it. That character, the, one of the brothers, um, he was amazing in the film. He is, his lines were delivered like perfectly because he would go from like being kind of uh, flamboyant to being very like hostile, <laughs> yeah. and he did it like seamlessly, and it was it was done so well. Yeah. Um, and then the music acts were actually pretty like okay, like they would have like it was just funny because like some of it felt like you're watching like a music video at times. And then I read that they did um, a soundtrack. They released yeah. a soundtrack for the film too after. 
Yeah, yeah. So that was like the that was the idea, and it was a good idea. And it and if it had gone on and and had actually you know been profitable, you know, uh, it would have given a lot of black writers and 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 the the acting. I'm I'm telling you the you know just brought in these actors that were just so ready to rip, you know, and and so in touch with their emotions, you know, there there was something. You know, when it's sit in the room with with all of them together and just go, wow, these there's an energy here that is not like the energy in my Greek family. You know, <laughs> it's like yeah. really incredible. The the actor that played uh, Big Pear, the yeah. the head uh, crime boss, it was he kind of like um, a seasoned actor because he did an amazing job in that. Yeah, movie. he's a seasoned character actor. Yeah, he was okay. really really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I posted awesome. that years and years ago and uh the people that liked it they really liked it so yeah that was when we first started and we were just trying to build content and i was like hey i saw this movie put a post up and people loved it so wow that's cool yeah 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 uh so you worked with your wife on a few films correct uh my wife becky or my other wife my first wife sally uh, I'm not sure. Maybe both. <laughs> yeah. Well, I Sally was uh, Sally work. was my wife in Austin, and she uh, was a caterer on Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. Um, and then she went on and became like a, a set decorator. But I don't think I ever worked with her in that capacity. Becky uh, came out with me to Los Angeles when I moved to Los Angeles, and. She worked as an assistant editor on Roar, and then she worked as an assistant editor with me on uh, Tourist Trap and on um, uh, Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker. And uh, and then at that point, she was like, that's it, fuck it, I'm going to go work with somebody else. <laughs> and she <Yeah>. left. <laughs> She's still my wife, but she started working with our friend Lee Percy just to get away, you know, so, so we'd have a little bit of yeah. separation in our lives, you know? Yeah. What's the secret to marriage? I think you just answered it. Yeah, yeah, like uh, <laughs> independence, yeah. <laughs> yeah, me and my wife just had that conversation. Uh, we are looking to move from where we are. And I said, the next house we get, separate bedrooms. Yeah, I, I've drawn the line at separate bedrooms. Although, you know, we got Omicron like, a, you know, over Christmas. And uh, so I, I slept in the other bedroom for those, you know, I was like, wow, this is kind of cool in a way because I can kind of watch whatever I want to on my computer, all the shit that she doesn't want to watch. Uh, but but then I was like, no, this is, you know, this is not no way to, to live, you know, but but to have separate spaces for sure, you know. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, and that brings us to subspecies phi. Yeah, okay. So here's the story with Subspecies 5. I wrote the script way back when, you know, about the time of vampire journals. Um, and, and just about that time, uh, Full Moon came crashing to a halt. And, and Charlie kind of took him a while to kind of rise from the ashes of that, uh, of that situation. And uh, the, the script was very ambitious, it covered like, you know, five centuries in Radu's life from when he was uh, mortal or, or, or at least, you know, semi-mortal before he was a vampire uh, to like the end of the 19th century. Um, and so we wanted to do the film, uh, but, but he didn't have the budget to do it. Over the years, when Anas and Denise and I get together, we talk about how much we want to do it, but we don't want to do it in a way that's going to lessen the, the franchise and, and kind of disappoint the people that, that appreciate the movies. So we kind of held fast to, uh, we're not going to do it unless we can do it right. Uh, and I've sort of whittled down the script to some of the, and some of the uh, scale of the script. The, the, the story is still spans the decades. I mean, the, the centuries, but it's not quite as elaborate as it was because uh, in last year, right before COVID, um, we were going to do the film finally. And I went to Albania uh, to scout locations uh, with a guy named Justin Martell, who, who was the kind of 
man who's putting together productions in foreign countries. Um, he works for we, Joe Bob. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and uh, so I scouted Albania when they were shooting um, Castle Freak there. And it turns out the castles in Albania are not quite as what I expected to see. You know, they're more like little fortresses. Um, and the, the downtown uh, is not quite as uh, neo-Gothic as, as like a Bucharest downtown. So it wasn't quite right. Um, and Justin said, no, no, forget Albania. I think they had some troubles with the production there. Uh, forget Albania, what about Serbia? So uh, uh, we're talking to Serbia. Uh, the budget is a little high in Serbia. So we're still trying to figure out how to, how to kind of meet their needs and get Charlie up a little bit and find the right budget to make the movie. And, and so we're kind of considering Serbia and Moldova, which sort of is recently came into the picture. Uh, Moldova is like, has what Romania has, but more like what Romania had in like 1990 or something. It's very, very uh, impoverished. So, so we're thinking maybe it's going to end up being Serbia if we can finally get the numbers to work and uh, hoping to do it in the spring or, or maybe early summer, depending on their schedule. Uh, we want to do it. We're dying to do it. We just have to do it in a, in a way that's not going to be too big of a compromise for us, you know. How long does it typically take you um, when you're making the subspecies films? How long does the whole filming process usually last? Uh, for subspecies one, it probably was 35 days or something over like a three or four month period because there were delays where we got shut down for a week and the crew would go on strike and it was a, you know, difficult. We'll um, read about it. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah. And then uh, two and three were shot kind of all of, in one shooting schedule, and I think that was about thirty-five days per. Um, but you know, I think subspecies th four was more like eighteen, probably. Yeah, as as the crews got more efficient in Bucharest, the the schedules kind of came down and, and also budgetarily, you know, they just can't afford to shoot too many days. Uh, Vampire Journals was probably, I think it was 21 or 24 days. Uh, and I, that's about a, as tight a schedule as I can deal with because I, I sort of, I want the shots to be cool too, you know, and I want the performances to, to be finessed. Um, but so we're looking for like 18 days for subspecies uh, five. And hopefully we'll, we'll, we're going to do it before we all are too old, you know, uh, that's a, that's the thing. We're definitely hoping to, to check it out once you guys yeah. finish it and complete it. It's because I it's a, definitely want to add it on to the series, you know, yeah, check it out for sure, man. Okay, cool. So, uh, Ted, before we wrap up, is there anything else that you want, <laughs> uh, people to know about that you're working on or, or that's out now, or where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Ted Nicolau. You can find me on Facebook. Uh, you uh, please check out uh, Don't Let Her In, uh, watch for subspecies. I'm working on a script with Justin uh, Martell that uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to reveal uh, sometime in the near future. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm here, I'm still working, still kicking and... Uh, <laughs> trying to get out of the house more, you know? I hear you. <laughs> so, Ted, thanks so much for joining us, man. This was really wonderful to hear. Thank you, um, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Our favorite films. So. Yeah, it was fun talking to you guys. Yeah. Thanks, man. Um, okay. So everybody have a good night. This is Dave. Brandon. This is Ted. Joshua. <laughs> Take care. Take care.